on this month's In the Life. How you define intersex or how you define hermaphrodite has been the subject of medical, religious, and legal debate for centuries. Every single culture has always had a range of gender expressions, but we haven't always been reviled and hunted and hated. You can blur the line between what's man and woman, male and female, by, by playing with that just a little bit. All this and more on America's Gay and Lesbian News Magazine. Kins of Life is funded in part by the H. Van Ameringen Foundation. Additional support provided by the Ford Foundation and by the annual support of In The Life members like you. Hello. I'm Charles Bush. In this episode, we're going into our archives to explore the diverse and colorful spectrum of gender. We're not always aware of it, but gender programming is deeply ingrained in all of us. As early as birth, it begins, uh, pink blanket for a girl, blue blanket for a boy. Sometimes subtle, yet always pervasive, this binary of male and female affects us throughout life. As an actor and a writer, I love to challenge and play with gender. Oh dear, does that make me a lesbian? Gender identity and expression can take many forms. Throughout time and in just about every culture, people have challenged and defied that most basic notion of boy and girl. Over the past decade, the transgender and intersex movements have gained momentum and consideration. Almost 200 major corporations across the country now ban workplace discrimination based on gender identity and expression. Ten years ago, there were none. Tonight's stories will explore this constantly evolving discussion around sexuality and gender. I went to the library and in it there's this, I think a lot of people would say a taboo section um, where all the books on gay and lesbian issues were kept. And I went to that section hoping to find something that might explain my identity and might explain the feelings that I, that I was um, struggling to um, come to terms with. And I came across this book and it was written by a trans woman and it was fairly old, it was probably from the 70s or 80s, and it was um, under the fairly new books. And it was the only book on transgender issues. So I took it home, and I can remember very vividly that day, I was, I was mesmerized by it. It was about 200, 300 pages long, and I read the book in a day. Mothers always find things that you wanna that you wanna hide or keep um, secret from them, and she found the book under my dresser. And mind you, I was still at church. I was coming outside actually to take a to take a breath of fresh air because it was so hot inside. And I have never in my life seen my mother drive so fast into the anywhere. And here she was, like a like a witch on a, on a broomstick, just running out there in her car down to the church driveway. And she stopped the car right in front of me and said, get in. She looked at me as she was driving 15 miles per hour down the road and said, you have to get rid of the book. And at that moment, I realized that now isn't the right time to talk about these issues and maybe I should hold off. And looking back on it now, I suffocated a part of me for a good four to five years until I was a senior in high school and realized that I couldn't hide this from my parents or my friends or my colleagues any longer, and I came out. What was previously referred to as hermaphrodite, the term intersex is now used to describe a condition in which a person is born with a reproductive or sexual anatomy that doesn't fit the typical definitions of female or male. 
Historically, when a baby was born intersexed, they were often assigned a gender through surgery. In recent years, there's been a growing movement to empower intersex people with choice, to select the gender that reflects who they are later in life, and that their right to gender expression be honored. When she was born, we thought we had a boy. We brought her home. Five days later, we found out that she wasn't a boy. She was a little girl. These like gangs of medical residents who would come into my room and like turn the light on in the middle of the night and force my legs apart. I cried. I asked them if they were crazy. They cut my clitoris off of me, and it was amputated from me. These are the personal stories from people whose lives have been affected by something that is little known and rarely discussed. My mother didn't think she had a choice. You know, she was told that without it, I would be a miserable, unhappy person, possibly be a lesbian, possibly have gender identity issues, and it needed to be done. The stories of people affected by a condition called intersex. Intersex, very briefly and very simply, is just a variation of chromosome or genital differences that don't match what society and medicine call standard male and female. As I was born with something called congenital adrenal hyperplasia, which is a form of intersex. I was born with an enlarged clitoris. It was, uh, it was quite enlarged, actually. It was about three centimeters long at birth. They, like I said, they didn't know if I was a boy or a girl. Once they determined that I was a girl because I had a uterus and ovaries, I was then scheduled for what they call feminizing surgery. And at the age of three months, I underwent a full clitor clitorectomy. In my medical records, it says that the clitoris was amputated to the nub. An intersex person, in a way, it's a kind of new concept that derives from an older idea of a hermaphrodite, that is someone who is a mixture of male and female tissue. Uh, how you define intersex or how you define hermaphrodite has been the subject of medical, religious, and legal debate for centuries. It originally was used in the late 1800s to refer to bisexual people. Then it moved into referring to people who had gender identity issues. And finally, in about probably the 1960s to 1970s, it began to be used for people born with what was commonly called before then hermaphroditism. The problem with the word hermaphrodite is people think about hermaphrodites from Greek mythology, and they think that it means people are born with two full sets of genitals, and that can't happen. That's biologically impossible. The other issue with hermaphrodite is it's also, it's quaint and it's Victorian, and it just doesn't really represent very well. The most common intersex disorder that we see is congenital adrenal hyperplasia. Uh, that one uh, is, makes up about 60% of the intercase, intersex disorders, and uh, they occur worldwide about 1 in 15,000 births. In the United States, it's probably closer to 1 in 30,000. So if you're looking for an absolute number, it's hard to give a specific number, but probably somewhere in the range of 150 to 300 cases in the United States a year of intersex disorders. There are some types of intersex conditions that are not obvious at birth so and may not get discovered until puberty. So when you start to include all of those numbers in there, it could be as high as 1 in 500. And I have actually seen some numbers by some experts who I respect who will say it's even as high as 1 in 250. Traditionally, the medical community referred to intersex people as a social emergency, rushing babies born with ambiguous genitalia into surgery to fix the child. The idea of doing surgery on children, infants who are born intersex, uh, began to develop in the 1940s as it also became technologically possible, which it wasn't earlier. In the 1950s, it was inconceivable that a mother could bond well to an XX child who had a very enlarged clitoris, one so large that it actually looked like a penis. The argument was that this was a mental health crisis uh, for the parent and therefore for the infant. The parents this, the parents are scared, the parents are traumatized. What will the parents tell their friends and neighbors? It's all about the parents and the child gets forgotten about. So we're fixing the child, we're changing the child we're surgically altering the child to make the parents happy. And there's something wrong with that equation. 
It was a belief that uh, they would be better off if um, we could identify a different, a specific male or female role. And this included even uh, trying to keep the information from the patient as they got older. Um, and this really was prevalent for almost 20 years. And often, doctors would assign a sex to the child based solely on the size of their genitalia. You know, there's actual measurements at birth, you know, that a, that a penis must be a certain size at birth, stretched, to qualify to be a healthily, a normally developed penis, and that's about two and a half centimeters. It's the same thing for a clitoris. If a clitoris is larger than about 0.9 centimeters at birth, medically, on the most basic term, is considered to fall outside of standard female. They will do periodically sex reassignment surgeries on boys born with something called micropenis. And they presume that the child will be happier as a girl rather than being a male with a small penis. You know, our society places a lot of value on the size of a man's penis, which is very, very sad. As intersex people mature, their lives can be filled with secrecy, shame, and unanswered questions. What makes us male or female? Is it our genitals? Is it our chromosomes? Is it our gender identity? Is it the way you perceive our, my gender identity? Who's to say? As Betsy searches for answers, she now runs an online support group called Bodies Like Ours. And it's her outreach that has made differences in people's lives. People like Lisa. My daughter, Samantha, she has a big wrist genitalia um, due to congenital adrenal hypoplasia, which is a disease that she was born with. Um, when she was born, we thought we had a boy. We brought her home. Five days later, we found out that she wasn't a boy. She was a girl. Lisa's doctor advised her against early surgery, as is the emerging medical trend. And of course, at that time, I was, oh, you're crazy. I'm having surgery. There's no way around it. You know, I wanted um, my daughter to have the best life that she could possibly have. And at that time, because I wasn't educated enough, I thought that that was why, the only way she could have a good life. Right after birth, um, the clitoris uh, may actually be more engorged than it will be in three months. So, you know, clearly waiting several months to see exactly what the actual clitoral size will be is probably important to do. Um, and it may not be as big an issue as it appears in that newborn period. I was lucky enough to have God tell me, hey, wait a minute, you better slow down and take a good look. Because, you know, she, I would have made the wrong decision if I didn't see a program like this. I mean, people don't know. They don't, they, they don't know. At least some of the parents I've encountered who refused to have surgery on their infants did it for religious reasons. They basically said, God gave me a baby that looked like this, and who am I to argue with God about it? So, and, um, so you don't have to be sort of liberal about sex and sexuality necessarily to say, go slow on surgery. The intersex movement is only about 10 years old. I mean, we are still pre-Stonewall in our activism and in our awareness as to where we're going with this. But because there's a lot of marginalization within the queer movement, the LGBT movement, there is that marginalization, there is that shame. We have looked at them and as that model to help us through this. You know, somebody who has only experienced the stigmatization of being homosexual, homosexual in this society that seems to hate us so much can understand what it's like to have your body physically changed for the same reason. My child has undergone four genital surgeries to try to make her genitals look cosmetically female. As a mother, I wanted my daughter to look normal, to fit right in. As advocates argue for better research and more autonomy, intersex groups have captured the ear of the medical community. When doctors decided that she should be brought up as a girl, their reason being that surgery to make her into a girl was easier to do than to change her into a boy. In the spring of 2004, the city of San Francisco and the San Francisco Human Rights Commission heard the first ever governmental public hearing about intersex issues. These babies were given no choice to keep what God gave them. On that night in May, several people with intersex conditions showed up and they testified before the Human Rights Commission. 
My child has tried to commit suicide twice in her 10 little years because she says she hates her body. She constantly asks me why they did the surgery. Parents showed up as well. Scholars and medical ethicists showed up as well. The overwhelming theme that was repeated time after time after time during that evening, that public hearing, was how damaging the current medical protocol and the current medical state of affairs is. She has articulated it to me this way. Quote, they thought I was no good, Mom. They scarred me up. As a result of that public hearing, the Human Rights Commission and the Intersex Task Force of the Human Rights Commission in San Francisco has been preparing a report that will include medical findings, social findings, ethical findings, as well as recommendations in all three of those. If this report is adopted, and hopefully it will be adopted by the time this airs, the impact that this report will have on the current state of affairs for intersex treatment in the United States is going to be dramatic. Who has the right to do that to anybody else's body? Mother, father, anybody. Who has that right to make that choice? And even if there's a 2% chance that something bad can happen from a cosmetic surgery, why wouldn't you just raise your children to be confident and to be proud of who they are and to be proud of their body? If we send the signal that it's okay to be ashamed of who you are because other people say so, then what kind of adults are they gonna be? Our society has always had rigid ideas about what gender should be. Quite simply, it is to most male and female. But for others, male and female is not so clearly defined for many, love and life exists beyond the basic concept of men and women. Gender is fluid, vibrant, even unpredictable. But in the end, individuals must define it for themselves. In 1996, In the Life first aired Gender Warriors. With a passion for personal expression, truth, and education, you are about to meet some people at the forefront of a movement that challenges the status quo. What transgender means to me is that you're a person that feels in your spirit, your mind, and your soul different than your physical anatomy, your biological anatomy. Whether that be uh, transsexual women and men, or masculine women and feminine men, or bearded women who allow their beards to grow, or women weightlifters who can't use the women's bathroom because they've been pumping iron. Uh, it can mean everyone who doesn't fit that Ozzy and Harriet paradigm of sex and gender. Transgender is just a big old umbrella term that includes just about everyone I know. Kate Bornstein and Leslie Feinberg have been explaining the term transgender for years, both as public speakers and as authors. I would say that Transgender Warriors is the book that I've had to write my entire life because every time someone said to me, I just don't get what you are, you know, well, maybe people don't have a right to beat you up or fire you or not hire you in the first place, but it's just not natural. Um, every time I sputtered, this was what I wanted to be saying, is that every single culture on this planet, every society, every continent, including the North Pole, has always had a range of gender expressions, but we haven't always been reviled and hunted and hated. This, this just happens. It's part of the culture. It's always been part of the culture. We've been the part that's been swept under the carpet, and now we're mm -hmm. coming out and we're saying, mm -mm, no more. Don't push me, Mary. I am not in the mood. It was at the Stonewall Rebellion, gay liberation shot heard round the world, where people who would today be considered transgender fought on the front lines. These are uh, currents of our community who have been visible, who had no closets to be in before there was a movement. But while Stonewall is remembered as the turning point for gay liberation, the shot heard round the world for the transgender community was the murder of Brandon Tina. Brandon Tina um, chose to, was, was born Tina Brandon and chose to live as a man in a small town in Nebraska. After a minor infraction with the police, they printed Brandon's birth sex in the town paper. Soon after, he was kidnapped, raped, and later murdered. People don't know the violence is going on, and they don't know the toll that it takes in shaping our lives. Every time someone shouts a slur at us, throws a beer can out the window, 
glares in anger and nudges their friends, that you live with the tension of knowing how quickly it can escalate into a life-threatening situation. What people are beat up for is for being genderqueer. They notice a boy who's acting too Nelly, who could be straight, transgendered, or gay. They notice a woman who's acting too butch. They notice a trans person, they can't figure out what the hell they are. That's where the assault comes. Ricky Ann Wilchins has been protesting transgender violence for years. Along with the group she founded, the Transsexual Menace, she's traveled far and wide, demanding an end to gender oppression. We took 100 um, trans and gender-friendly people up to Capitol Hill, and we spent two days lobbying. One of my favorite stories, I forget which senator it was, was meeting with a constituent from, uh, from our group. He had never seen a constituent who came to him and said, I'm transgendered, I vote. I pay taxes, there's no reason why I should be subject to the kinds of hate crimes and discrimination that I have to suffer through. A civil rights movement at its heart is a selfish movement that says, you've got yours, I'm coming to get mine. A movement has a moral focus and a center when it says, it's not just about me, but I connect to everyone. No one could agree with that statement more than Martine Rothblatt. To me, the civil rights movement, the feminist movement, the gay and lesbian and transgender movements all really are one and the same. These are all movements to respect people as individuals rather than as a body type that their um, genes determine for them. Martine Rothblatt has in her life crossed many borders. Martine was formerly Martin, a Jewish man married to an African-American woman with four kids. The only thing that has changed in this picture is Martin's gender. Being a, my, my spouse, when I talked to her about transitioning, I said sometimes that, um, you know, would you still love me if I did transition and, and live as a woman? And, and she always said, Martine, I love your soul. It doesn't matter to me, um, you know, what gender identity you wrap that soul in. Before transitioning, Martine did a lot of research on how changing genders might affect their children compiling it later into this book, The Apartheid of Sex. I couldn't find a shred of evidence that um, transitioning one's gender was um, bad for their kids in any way. And in fact, what happened is I found myself um, harkening back to research I had done in college about the effect on children of interracial marriages. And people found that those kids grew up like Great, brilliant, creative, beautiful, no problem. At my house, really, we do a lot of things that normal families do, but we do like a couple other things just to keep us closer. And every Friday, as well as, well as celebrating the Sabbath, we have a um, tradition that we sing a song and, and share what love means to us, and we just call the ceremony Love Night. I think when people say you can't change your gender, that's like somebody saying, you can't change your religion, you can't change your country. I've talked to people who say, wow, I've grown up in this small town and I would just never move out of a small town. Well, that's cool for them. And, but there are other people who are just from birth or they develop a spark in themselves that they have to travel a journey in their life. And changing your gender is no more different, I think, than changing your religion or changing your country. It's like you're an immigrant, okay? You're a convert. You're a social explorer. Throughout history, many people have lived as the opposite sex to pursue their dreams. In this next segment, you'll meet the talented and dynamic musician Billy Tipton. While born a woman, living as a man proved to be a, a means by which Billy could achieve success in the male-dominated world of jazz. Neither peers nor lovers knew of his secret. But one thing is known for sure. In both his private and professional life, he lived and played from the heart. Dorothy Lucille Tipton was born in Oklahoma City in 1914 to a family that encouraged her passion for music from a young age. Her goal was to play professionally in a jazz band. There was just one problem. Women in the jazz business usually took a back seat to the men, and Dorothy wanted time in the spotlight. 
As biographer Diane Middlebrook explains, Dorothy found an unusual solution to achieve her goal. She was going to go audition for a job, and in order to get it, she was going to put on men's clothes. She put on a man's jacket, slicked her hair back, went off, auditioned for the job, got the job, went on the road, came home with money in her pocket. And from that day on, they said, she never looked back. She saw that this was the way that she was going to be able to get what she wanted, which was work in a band. Defying the odds, Billy Tipton carved out a career in the music business that lasted more than 40 years. Billy made his living playing music, and that was hard to do. He wasn't a star. He wasn't a recording star, for example. He was never on television and never made it big, but he had a very solid professional life. On stage and in his private life, Billy guarded his secrets so well that four of his five wives, his three adopted sons, and most of the musicians that he worked and traveled with said that they didn't suspect that Billy was anything other than he seemed. Dorothy found in herself the ability to be an entertainer, an actor, acting the role of a musician as well as playing the music, and that that double identity was Billy Tipton. Jameson Green, founder of FTM International, a support group for female-to-male transgendered people, suspects that there may have been another factor in Billy's choice besides his love of music. Maybe he put it on as a way to get a job in the beginning, or maybe that's just what he told people because it was a safe thing to say. But ultimately, there's a place where this becomes who you are, and to take that identity off means not being yourself anymore. So in that way, Billy Tipton's experience much more closely relates to the kind of experience that trans people have as he was living as a man, he was able to express himself as a man and able to actualize that identity. Was Billy Tipton a role played with consummate skill by an enterprising and talented actress? Or was Billy the real personality of the girl born as Dorothy? Billy left no memoirs or records. He did say to one of his cousins, you know, I'm, I'm a normal person. I'm not a freak. I'm not a hermaphrodite. This has been my choice. This, this way of life has been my choice. The important thing to, to be understood about trans people is that they aren't being who they are not. They are being who they are. Billy described himself as a musician and as a man. The most important thing about honoring Billy is not to take those identities away from him. Still to come on In the Life. Making music, making changes. I've had a lot of people say to me, you know, uh, it's really something that I see you now and I see you as, I have the feeling I'm seeing you as you really are. I didn't really have any role models uh, when I was starting out. You're watching In The Life. As a child, David Buchner was a musical prodigy, impressing his music teacher with his ability to sight read music at the age of four. He went on to study at Juilliard at the age of 17 and began entering and winning competitions after graduation. His skills as a performer were in great demand, and he also enjoyed success as a professor at the Manhattan School of Music and New York University. But no matter how much he achieved, David felt like there was something missing from his life. I was playing a role. You know, I was playing the role of David Buchner very, very well, but it was... I felt increasingly so empty inside that was not me. And um, the fact that I played it well brought no comfort to me. At a certain point, I just basically decided I could not be two people anymore. That's what it felt like. I mean, it, it was just like being a schizophrenic. And it's, it, was, it was horrible. It's really horrible. In July of 1998, at the age of 39, David Buchner played his last performance, then hung up his tuxedo for good. Sarah Buchner made her debut in September, and along her journey has rediscovered her joy in music. And what has been the most beautiful thing, really, has been coming in here to teach in a classroom with students who have come up to me in the halls. Um, one person said, you know, you're my role model. I never would have expected this in a million years. Okay, now this is all transition to the second theme. Professionally, I assumed in a cynical sense, the concerts would, 
would come. Would, 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 uh, I didn't expect it would explode, but I thought that somebody would say, hey, that's going to sell tickets. Let's, let's, let's hire her. And instead, quite the opposite. It seems to have been totally shut down. I've had a lot of people say to me, you know, uh, it's really something that I see you now, and I see you as, I have the feeling I'm seeing you as you really are. From the world of classical music to that of heavy metal, transgendered musicians are making their mark. Christine Beattie is the lead singer of Glamazon, a band she co-founded in 1993. I want people to see that um, I'm a person worthy of respect, a person worthy of civil and human rights. A lot of the songs that we do get into the social commentary. Holy War, which is the first song on our CD, um, takes to task hypocrisy in religious leaders and some followers. Christine's inner struggle to accept her identity as a woman brought her face to face with some frightening issues. In general, I haven't gotten a lot of support for this um, from my family, from none of the people that were supposedly my friends at the time. I became a major heroin addict, and um, I was on welfare. I was no good to anybody, especially myself. She found refuge in her writing, in her work as a computer programmer, and increasingly in her music. There's just no feeling that can compete with being up there on stage with uh, the atmosphere just right, and you know you're sounding good, and the crowd's loving you. Um, there's just nothing to compare with that. Rock music tends to be male-dominated in the first place, and so women being in rock, that alone is, is a challenging concept. You throw in the transgender issue on top of that, um, there's been quite a few doors that have been closed to me. Um, on the other hand, it's a great way to get people to pay attention to you. <laughs> I think there's been a lot of change in people's awareness. The whole transgender movement has really picked up, and the amount of education that's going on now about what transgender is and what it means is phenomenal. I didn't really have any role models uh, when I was starting out other than, you know, the, the top dollar prostitutes. And uh, um, I think it's important for uh, people with gender issues to see that you don't need to go that route, that, they're, that you can be a professional, you can be an artist, you can be whatever you set your mind to be. The 20th century brought about great changes in how we think about gender. So what does it mean if we do not want to follow the traditional model of male and female? How do gender role expectations define us? And how do we navigate a society where there is still great disparity between men and women, economically, sexually, and socially? These are questions to which there are no easy answers. Our next segment from 2005 begins to explore these questions as we talk to individuals leading the discussion around the issue of what gender means to us all. Before industrialization, everyone in a whole family worked together. What industrialism did is it pulled men out of their houses to factories or to other kind of workplaces and left women at home, but that's only the theory. They were doing industrial work at home for wages while they were supposedly taking care of their homes and kids. Hello, operator. Give me Pennsylvania 65. Oh, oh, oh. Everyone suffers from wars, but ironically, sometimes women benefit because the guys go away. The uh, somewhat hidden truth about the World War II jobs is that they were very hard, they were really dirty, there were a lot of industrial accidents, and women loved them. The government played a very active role in managing the labor force. Uh, starting in around 1940, they were propagandizing all over the place about how women could work and still be, quote, feminine, could be good wives. After the war, they reversed it, and they started a, a large propaganda campaign about how mothers belong at home. Gender then gets used as a club with which to beat people. The main heterosexual privilege that women have is the fact that they're attached to men who earn bigger salaries. 
But the relationship between gender and sexuality and the economics of both took a new turn in the second wave of the women's movement. When I came out in the mid-70s, it certainly made me question my gender suitability. Here she is. She is single and fun-loving. And as the movement shaped a single identity, woman with a capital W, gay identity complicated femininity. I worried about whether I was feminine enough, knowing I was attracted to girls and being a tomboy. Uh, and that scared me enough that it kept me from coming out, it kept me from feeling good about myself for a very long time. There had always been a conservative edge of the women's movement that was extremely frightened of the homosexuality issue for fear that the women's movement would lose its respectability if it was associated with what Betty Friedan called the lavender menace. Um, I think actually that was always a, a very minority position. I think that the masses of people in the women's movement were really quite open to challenging and thinking about sex and gender in different ways. Probably the single most important message of second wave feminism was that there is such a thing as gender and it's not the same as sex. And today's activists are charging forward in this belief. I like to say that there are many genders. It's the way we as individuals are socialized and how we adapt. For some folks, it's how they get up in the morning and the clothes they pick out to the people that they desire and want to date. Anything from hormones or surgery to people thinking about, um, you know, how that impacts their sexuality. I always felt this sort of sense of like, I didn't quite know what being a woman, you know, an American woman meant. I was born here, but my, my parents being immigrants were really sort of outsiders in a lot of ways. I remember there were all these rituals that these girls in my school would do around makeup and hair and shaving. And I remember feeling very awkward and uncomfortable and like I didn't know what I was doing. My mother, uh, who I think of because of her strength and her real independence, I think of her as a femme, um, but she certainly wasn't someone who was going to teach me these things about what it meant to be a girl. I went to a college where there were a lot of white, mostly middle class dykes, and everyone had the same sort of short buzz cut and baggy pants and shirt look. I cut off all my hair, I did the whole androgyny drag thing. I was miserable and I felt like I was in drag. You try and tell a femme who is like a, a femme feminist not to be femme and feel like this is her political expression to be femme and to be lesbian and be all that she is, you know? You try, you try and tell her, you know, it's not gonna happen. There's always the suspicion that a femme isn't really queer um, because look how feminine they are and everything feminine is not radical, right? Butch femme, that is like the most freeing thing for folks to finally have some way to say like, this is my expression and I get it. I've had experiences with people who said things to me like free yourself from your enslavement and, and sort of coaching it as a joke, but you knew that there, I knew that there was an edge underneath that was like, you're a dupe of the gender system. Every social movement has this danger of getting into this hardened kind of orthodoxies, right line and forgetting uh, the sort of let a thousand flowers bloom um, approach. My father raised me in a way that I could do anything that I wanted to do. Even though like I was forced to wear frilly dresses and I had pancakes, he raised me to be very independent and still values that. But I don't think society on a whole thinks that way a lot about girls and women. I think it's hard for people to conceive of femme without butch because, let's face it, when I walk down the street by myself, I'm not read as queer. And I know that, you know, unless I was wearing something that would signify that. Um, but when I'm walking down the street with a butch who's my lover, then I'm read as queer. So I think that that's why femme often gets discussed in relation to butch. And it frustrates me because I'm just as queer, even if I may not be read as such, whether I'm with 
a butch or someone butch identified or by myself. People who are not seen on top because they don't fit those categories on like race and class and age and um, gender identity, like need to fight as much like within the LGBT community as we do on other levels, you know, outside of the LGBT community. Things that are masculine are assigned much more value than things that are feminine. And that's true in the queer community too, um, in many segments. I mean, it might get played out differently depending on different things, but that um, femme's not worth talking about as an identity by itself when it has a really rich, you know, history. I'm like one of many, and there are many people out there who do femme very differently than me. I would dare say that gender is the most powerful social, cultural pressure there is. So I really identify as a butch fag, um, which brings up a lot of issues. When I started to feel, you know, like more comfortable in being butch, I started to find myself more attracted to men and it scared me so much because I'm just like, what does this mean? Like even like thinking about like how I'm gonna talk about this with my family is gonna be really difficult because the language that I have for it is in English and I don't have this language in Spanish. Like to my family, I'm a lesbian and I'm fine with being a lesbian to my family <laughs> or like I'm gay, you know, like, and that's fine because that's the only word I could come up with to like express who I am and that they understand. You know, as someone who identifies as transsexual and you know, I, I have a very healthy respect for the binary of the understanding of sex, male, female. At the same time, very clear that, you know, I'm not trying to use it in an oppressive way. I'm not trying to like check it off. I'm not disvaluing one sex over the other. You know, my whole show B4T is on the basis of what it was like of butchness or the androgyny of, in the period of time in my life, the androgyny wasn't necessarily an identity of mine, but that's how I looked. And people spent more time trying to figure out who I was than sort of like, hi, my name is Imani. How young little children are when they know that they're either a girl or a boy. Uh, it takes much longer to learn what race you are and what class you are. It's gonna be hard to break that down. It's very, very rooted. And it straightjackets everyone. Someone once recently asked me how long I've been transgendered. And I simply replied, well, all my life. Many people in the transgender community do not undergo a linear transition from one to the other. Many don't undergo a medical transition. Um, I had an entirely non-medical transition. Gender has been medicalized, but I don't believe that I have a gender identity disorder. I think it's society that has a gender identity disorder. In the 19th century, or you know, the first half of the 20th century, no one would have understood. People are not born destined to live out a certain kind of life in the social division of labor. The same way that I don't say, oh, lesbian and gay men somehow created transphobia. You know, I don't think, I don't look at white people as creating racism. I look at it as systematic. And in fact, it belittles racism when it's some individual thing. No, this is a system. This is a, a case in which I think that the gender and the racial meanings are organized into a really universal kind of class domination meaning that boy or girl are always what you call the people who you are dominating uh, in class terms. Part of what true gender, uh, gender liberation looks like is the ability to be free from the expectation of a fixed gender identity. We need to be respectful and we need to be um, inclusive, uh, all the various forms of expression in our community because this is how we're oppressed in greater society. On campuses across the country, students have always pushed the boundaries of tradition. Our next story takes us to Vanderbilt University, where you'll meet Everett Moran. Every year, Vanderbilt for Homecoming elects 
Mr. Vanderbilt and Miss Vanderbilt, and together they are the perfect heterosexual couple. They are a king and queen, a royal couple. King and queens are usually married. They are a couple together. So when we have a king and queen as the top representative of the senior class, they are a heterosexual couple. It is an assumption of heterosexuality. When people see representations that don't fit within it, they're confused because that's all they've been fed their entire lives. That's what they see as normal. That's what they see as appropriate. That's what they see as American. Homecoming is pretty important here at Vanderbilt. Um, the traditions are the same as they were, you know, 10, 20 years ago. When I stand on a football field at a homecoming event in a dress as a man, I'm not only threatening heterosexual power, but I'm also threatening male power. Next, Next we, we present, present Everett Moran, Moran from Midland, Texas. I arrived at the football stadium in a very tasteful, empire-waisted black cocktail dress. Then we all just walked out in a line, Everett stood out on the field, presented as the homecoming court to the entire community, um, and then they announced king and queen. I'm an officer for the undergraduate GLBT group here at Vanderbilt, and we came together a few weeks before nominations were due, the officers, and discussed what we wanted to do. Um, and I proposed that we present it to our membership and see if they wanted to nominate anybody for king and queen, and then if they wanted to play with gender a little bit and nominate a boy for uh, queen and a girl for king. There wasn't any like opposition during the time of the voting and the judging process from anybody. It was when he made the top five, or actually was the top six this year, that was when all the letters started rolling into the hustler and the opposition came up. A lot of people don't understand gender stereotypes, gender roles, they don't understand heterosexism, they don't understand homophobia, they don't even understand homosexuality for that. I think we stayed within the traditions and I don't think that we disgraced the campus at all. I think different times call for different needs and, you know, times are changing. Vanderbilt is not the first campus to have a male queen candidate. People did vote for Everett and that's why he did make, you know, the top six after that student body voted for him and I feel like I think that it generated a lot of conversation. I think that it's something that was very positive for the Vanderbilt campus. I think that a lot of students learned a lot from it and were forced to talk about issues that might make them uncomfortable. You can blur the line between what's man and woman, male and female, by, by playing with that just a little bit. And that was one of the big reasons why I chose to do this, because that boundary needs to be pushed, especially at a place like Vanderbilt. Same-sex marriage is a hot-button issue, both nationwide and within the gay and lesbian community. How is it that Betty married Helen six years ago? Tonight, we hear from this couple and learn about their remarkable relationship. I had a very shallow understanding of what I was dealing with in the beginning. I thought it was about sex and I thought it was about, you know, costume. I told her about me being trans about a week and a half in, and basically thinking, I like this person way too much, and you should know this now, so that if you want to go, you can. The way I always thought about gender was something, you know, socially constructed that you can mess with and let people guess which you were, and that, that was a, a space I liked. Passing is, in the, its strictest sort of definition, is the ability to be taken for the gender you're presenting as, with nobody knowing that you are not that gender in a physical way. Um, I like to think of passing anymore as the ability to function well in the world. Betty and Helen met nearly seven years ago and openly discussed the difficulties around maintaining a relationship that challenges cultural interpretations of gender and sexuality. Most couples are not one man and one woman. I've always thought of it as a percentage thing. Some couples are, you know, the guy's 80% masculine, the woman's 20%, you know, and that's where the 100 evens out. I don't know what the number would be. But we're sure 51, 49, and I'm sure there are a lot of other couples like that. And couples like Betty and Helen are now asserting their right to marry. I mean, I knew within three weeks that I wanted to spend my life with her. The marriage certificate, even when people can't see our relationship, there's a piece of paper that tells them what it is. The two tied the knot in a small civil ceremony five years ago. The thing that was most important to me was really sort of getting to stand in front of friends and family and say, I love this woman and I choose to be with her forever. Because of our, our genitals, you know, we managed to get a certificate. and. 
it's kind of astounding to me that that's what it's based on. One of my friends who is a lesbian got very upset with me that I was taking part in an institution that she could not take part in, which I understood very well. But it was only when she was talking about hospital visit, medical decisions, health insurance, that I realized how important it was for us to legally get married. I'm with someone who's transgendered. And in terms of making sure that Betty is not going to be put in a situation where anyone is surprised at what physical parts she may have, depending on how she's dressed, uh, that I could be someone who could be there. I could be in there. Even members of the medical community have you know, started working on someone who is a, a transsexual person and realized that they still had their male genitals and stopped stopped doing the medical treatment and, and basically let the person die instead. Reflecting Helen's concerns, court cases like Christy Littleton's in Texas illustrate the need for couples to have legal rights in the event of a tragedy. Littleton's husband, Jonathan, died in what she believed was malpractice. The physician's response was, you're transsexual, so you weren't married at all. You do not have standing to be suing me. Rather incredibly, both the trial court and the Texas Court of Appeal affirmed the doctor's position and said, that's right. Even though the state of Texas has recognized you as a woman, even though you obtained a marriage license, you were not legally married. While this gender discrimination invalidated Littleton's marriage, it's exactly what enabled Helen and Betty to legally wed. We've got all this sort of legal protections and whatnot that you get when one man marries one woman. And sometimes I... I Honestly, God, sometimes I actually feel slightly guilty about it because I don't identify um, as anything to do with the sort of one man, one woman. Anti-gay organizations make really lurid predictions about what's going to happen after lesbian and gay people win the right to marry, that what will be next is transgender people. That's a really uninformed position, since the opposite is actually the case right now. Most transgender people are already able to marry. Why can't there be two people who are feminine in a relationship? It's like we take the whole opposites attract thing to a point of making it you know, cement, it's a cement wall. We are a queer couple with heterosexual privilege and dealing with that is one of the most oddly stressful things ever. Heterosexual is, is um, who you screw. <laughs> straight is a, is, a, is a mindset. Straight, is, straight has more, is, is about more things than sex. It's political. It's political, it's proper, it can be, it can be a lot of different things, but it's always kind of based in this sense of being normal. You know, I'm normal. I'm straight. I'm normal. Well, people look at me and they're never going to assume that. And I don't want to be normal. It just sounds boring. Dealing with normal, especially when it comes to marriage and gender, is, is impossible. You can't have an equal partnership. Well, it's only getting outside of you know, the traditional heterosexual relationship that we've found love and mutual support. I'm Charles Bush. For all of us at In The Life, thanks for tuning in, and we'll see you next month.
Life is funded in part by the H. Van Emmeringen Foundation. Additional support provided by the Ford Foundation and by the annual support of In the Life members like you.